before we commence, I would like to call Hafiza Umayya of M. English third semester evening session for the recitation and translation from a few verses of Holy Quran. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا I seek refuge of Allah from certain outcast in the name of Allah who is the most beneficent and most merciful. You who believe, let not your properties or your children divert you from the remembrance of Allah. And whosoever does that, then they are the losers. And spend in charity of that with which we have provided you before death comes to one of you. And he says, my Lord, if only you would give me respite for a little while, then I should give sadqa and be among the righteous and other good deeds. Thank you so much. Jazakallah. Now I would call upon the stage our regional director, Brigadier Retired Muhammad Akram Khan to please come and welcome our guests. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have a very important guest today, all the way from United States, Texas. He is uh, from University of North Texas, uh, Dr. Masood Ashraf Raja. He is going to deliver a, a talk today on scholarly publishing and tomorrow probably it is hand-on practice for everybody how to arrange scholarly publishing. Uh, so he is very important to 
we had a bad job and People are very intelligent, but they don't have to flourish and But when they get the environment, they show themselves up everywhere. In the United States, in Europe, and everywhere, wherever they go. And he is one of those. Then we have uh, Professor Rao Jalil M. He is father of our head of the department. Kashif Rao, fatherly Rao, he is also uh, fatherly to the University of Man Management and Technology. He is a person there in the Department of English. I said that we are going to get the benefit of your youth today. We are going to call you for your prayers. Then we have uh, Dr. Asim from UMT. He is looking after the PhD program and many students are sitting here afraid of him and looking towards him, what is going to happen to us and they are doing PhD there. Uh, and I am sorry, uh, uh, sorry, I didn't uh, know your name, but we have guests from other universities, they are likely to come, maybe they come slightly later, but uh, as a military organization and then doctor's presentation, uh, it, it always starts in time. So we have started our uh, program for our own faculty. Uh, sir, I welcome you all uh, on behalf of uh, my own self and on behalf of the faculty and everybody from uh, Namal Lahore campus. And I'm thankful to the members of faculty who have uh, got up early in the morning after having a fast and uh, dare to come to Nangal Gaur campus fast and uh, they are actively participating in the uh, workshop scholarly publishing and I was thinking this scholarship scholarly publishing what it could be and then I focused on the word scholarly I thought there must be some scholars here and uh, they are going to discuss uh, what a scholar is and what scholarly publishing is. So first of all one has to be scholar and we are expecting more scholars probably Mr. Vaseem Hassan will get them together and uh, they must be coming. And uh, you are all senior and uh, after some experience and after retirement people start writing scholarly top type of things and then these things are published and phir wo akhbar mein bhi aata hai aur tv pe bhi aata hai and that is the stage when you have experience after about 60 plus but you need to be trained for that and you should have basic uh, understanding and knowledge about that okay, what a scholarly publishing is and that is why this talk and this workshop has been arranged for the information of our guests we have a uh, collaboration between Namal University and University of North Texas for training of our uh, faculty. Uh, last year uh, we sent, uh, here are the more scholars we are getting from UMT probably. Uh, last year uh, we sent two our, uh, of our members, Mr. Vaseem Hassan and Mr. Uh, Zaheer attended uh, one month long workshops, uh, training sessions, and this year uh, Mr. Kashif Rao also went for about two weeks for uh, a training session. And, but everybody cannot go to Islamabad. So we suggested that uh, it is only for Islamabad, so what about the regional campuses? And then uh, they arranged two days workshop for us also. And that is how uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Masood is with us for two days, today and tomorrow, and uh, he's going to guide you and teach you on scholarly publishing. <coughs> Thank you for coming, all those who came late. Uh, I welcome you all on behalf of everybody. Uh, brief introduction of Dr. Uh, Professor Dr. Masood Ashraf Raja. Yeah, yeah. 
uh, over and above being army officer he is a poet a novelist a writer a speaker of four languages and above all a research scholar and a dedicated teacher at university of north texas he is an alumni of namal and did a diploma in japanese language from namal in 1993 uh, dr masood moved to united states in 96 after 10 years of service in pakistan army as an infantry officer he graduated with a masters in literature from belmont university in 2002 and earned his phd in post colonial studies from florida state university in 2006 there was a session last year about post colonial studies and we used to have good talk with madam aisha and other people the what is post colonial study and uh, <coughs> but we just heard it from islamabad we didn't know what you taught so that is why we bothered you to come here While at Belma University Dr Masood was awarded the graduate writing award and at Florida State University he was awarded the Davis award for best graduate student in 2005 and Davis award for best dissertation in 2006 that is what i said pakistani students can do wonders everywhere <coughs> at UNT presently he is associate professor of post colonial literature and theory at the University of North Texas and the editor of Pakistan Yath a journal of Pakistan studies on open access journal and open access journal that he founded in 2009 he founded in 2009 they are in america they didn't found it <coughs> Dr Masood specializes in politics of the Islamic world issues of united states relations with the muslim world with a specific focus on pakistan afghanistan and middle east a strong proponent of peace social justice and human rights Dr Masood hopes to foster a better understanding between his primary culture and rest of the world know about his scholarly publishing his book constructing pakistan is an interesting explanation of the rise of political identity of muslims during the british raj by the way sorry to interrupt Madam Zakia Nasser is very important person to us. He is she is from uh, University Lahore University uh, Lahore College Women University. He is she is head of the department there, and we we keep bothering her. <coughs> so coming back, uh, his. Uh, book constructing pakistan is an interesting explanation of the rise of political identity of muslims during the british raj and offers an innovative explanation of the genesis of the idea of pakistan he is working on another book titled talibanization of america now we have a feeling that is something wrong in america also which is likely to be published in few months time Besides his academic and popular writings Dr Masood has also actively presented his views at academic conferences as well as through public talks Recently he has also contributed his views to newspapers on various issues related to the Islamic world and Pakistan So when you are sitting there you are looking at the world entire world and the entire world is being discussed here and within that forum and which is that uh, atmosphere given when you discuss pakistan your feelings are much different than what you discuss pakistan here so that is what i keep saying that we must have an exposure uh, to outer world also 
He has also published extensively in his area of study as well as on general academic topics in various academic journals and anthologies. He is also a member of the advisory committee of the premier journal of literature and languages and has been elected as member of the executive committee of the South Asian Studies Group Modern Language Association. Then there is a long list, five, seven pages long list of his contributions in various spheres, his dissertations, his writings, his presentations, his contribution to the newspapers and journals. So uh, instead of going into that detail, uh, if you want, you can, uh, they are available with me in the office, so I didn't want to go into that. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming and joining us, and uh, special thanks to Dr. Masood Ashraf Raja, who came all the way from the United States and from Islamabad to deliver a talk to us. I'm grateful to my assistants, Ms. Sadia and uh, Huria and Anam and uh, the student also. Uh, they worked hard two days back and uh, today they have been able to make some arrangements for us. Thank you very much. So now I request Dr. Saab to come over. Thank you so much, Gadi uh, Akram, for such. Whoa, whoa, whoa. These kind of introductions make you feel important about yourself. <laughs> but it's a, it's a great pleasure uh, and an honor to be here. And uh, and it was no trouble at all because you know uh, there is one city in Pakistan, Lahore, which if it calls you, you come, right? Uh, so it's it's really a pleasure to be here. And. Uh, and as for our program with Nomal in Islamabad, this is, we are in the second year and uh, it's going really well. Uh, we have had so far also 21 of your faculty and graduate students who have come and stayed with us uh, for six weeks each. And then we're hoping to welcome the next cohort in uh, August, uh, I think 14 of them. So it's really my campus and my university is really delighted to have uh, this opportunity. So today's uh, talk, it's a two-day conversation, two days workshop. Um, and of course, uh, I come in front of you uh, with all due humility because um, publishing is a hard thing to do. And, uh, and teaching it is even harder. So uh, most of what I'll be sharing is based in my own experience uh, of having published with several kinds of journals, uh, but, but just to go through uh, not very deeply philosophical issues about scholarly publishing, but practical issues of uh, what does it take. Uh, now, please do keep in mind that uh, the first time when I came to Numal, uh, Reader Said was introducing me and he showed them the list of my publications and all. And, and I had to point it out to the faculty that a lot goes into your publication, and more than 50% of it is institutional support. Uh, and about 50% is your own work. So uh, if I can publish a lot, part of it is because uh, you know I, I have access to a world-class library. Uh, I have access to uh, research librarians who, who respond to my email within 20 minutes and find me sources from all over the world. Uh, I have a library of about 5,000 books in my own office, so sometimes I don't even have to leave my own office. And most of those books were bought because of different grants. So I mean, uh, institutions do play an important role in your productivity, and, and w we need to acknowledge that. And so. So to know that 
publication is, is kind of a synchronized dance between the resources of your institution and you yourselves. Uh, and you, uh, you alone can't really do, do that much. Uh, so that's my day one. And so uh, I'm going to start with asking you a few questions. Like, I mean, wh why do we publish as scholars? I mean, these are the questions that we ask ourselves. Uh, at the end of the day, what's the use of it? So I, I usually ask this question of my graduate students. And these are uh, the top four are some of the answers I get. So uh, it can be to produce knowledge and uh, to contribute to your field, to, imp to impact the world, and then to meet professional requirements. Uh, now, when I, when I say to produce knowledge, uh, it's roughly not really in that Arnoldian sense. Uh, I don't subscribe to that idea of pro knowledge production where you just detach yourself from the world, the scholarship of detachment that he called, and you just continue producing your work with the hope that eventually it will change uh, human thought. But we do think, especially as humanists, uh, you know, our work has no utility in today's world. I mean, how, how do you tell people come and study literature? Uh, so one of the arguments that we make is that we produce knowledge and that knowledge somehow uh, makes a difference in the world. Uh, and so we, we produce theoretical knowledge, knowledge about culture, knowledge about issues of uh, you know, gender, power. So I think that's one of the main uh, uh, important factors that factors into when we do our research and publish. And the second one on the list is to contribute to your field. Okay, and that's a very interesting question because most of the times uh, in Pakistan when I mention the field, uh, it's, it's not, it doesn't translate uh, because, so our English departments are mm, mostly, a traditional English department in the United States is divided into two strands. There's your British lit people and American literature people. Then in British literature you have your specialists, you know, you'll have your medievalist, you will have your early modernist, you'll have your Victorians, your 18th century, and then your modernists. And within that there will be certain generic distribution. There will be some who specialize in drama, some in poetry. And similarly in American studies we have early American, then American realism, 19th century American, 20th century American. And within that there are conceptual fields like African American studies, post-colonial studies, gender studies, feminist studies. So each scholar is in a discipline which is called English and within that your specific area is your field. And we do our hires in the field. All our job announcements are whosoever wants it. It would be we need a Victorianist. We need a 18th century scholar. We need, need a medievalist. So a faculty has all these slots filled. And so when I say you contribute to your field, that means that as a post-colonialist, pretty much most of what I write has something to do with my field. Uh, and it's important to acknowledge that because that means you have to know your field. And in order to know your field, you need to know where it is. So you're constantly reading up. Uh, you're reading all the major journals in your field that come up. You're reading all the major books that come out every year by your main scholars. So most of the times, like when some of the scholars in your field are too productive, you're just hoping that maybe, you know, something will happen to them and they'll stop publishing. And, but, but, you know, so, uh, so that's how you know where your field is. Because unless you know what the debates are and where it is, you cannot enter the conversation uh, because research in all its aspects is a conversation with what's happened before you or where the conversation is headed. Uh, but knowing the field also tells you what topics you know, have been covered better by someone else and maybe what you're writing isn't all that good. So that's an, another reason that I've listed here as to why we publish 
and then to impact the world. I mean, you know, after all, if you, uh, and that's as a post-colonialist, some of my colleagues uh, would disagree with me in the United States, especially people who do just textual studies and uh, believe that teaching the text is our only responsibility in the classroom. Uh, but as a post-colonialist, uh, you know, uh, you know, I, I grew up in the 70s Pakistan when Fasab was alive and Habib Jalib was producing his poetry. Uh, so, you know, I'm a leftist Marxist academic. So for me, whatever I do has to have one foot in the public sphere. Whatever I write, whatever I publish and teach has to be connected to the world because otherwise, uh, what's the point of reading a good poem or a good play if somehow we cannot relate it to the world? Uh, if it doesn't make us somewhat more compassionate, uh, more progressive, and more tolerant people who go out in the world and you know, see other people and connect with them. So for me personally, uh, making an impact in the world through your work uh, is, is a crucial part of your research. And you can see the examples. I mean, if, you, if you've read Edward Said, uh, you know that one book you know, just one book published in 1978 called Orientalism can change how we study literature, how we study Middle East, how we do anthropology, how do we do sociology. So, so books that we write and articles that we write do literally impact uh, the world. And so that's another important thing. And then I come to the most skeptical and cynical reason for publishing, right? Because if, 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 if your reason is just to meet the professional requirements, uh, it's, it's a valid reason. I mean, you, you, we all need to keep our jobs. And, uh, and I think uh, the system in America is even more ruthless. So when you're pre-tenure research faculty, you get about six years. Like the requirements in my department or uh, by the time you apply for tenure, you have to have your book published uh, with a reputable publisher, and you need to have uh, a very uh, dis discernible uh, history of publishing in journals, so at least six or seven refereed articles. And if you don't have it, you could be the best teacher in the world, uh, you could be the best department member in the world. When you go up for tenure, chances are you're not going to get it. And when you don't make tenure in American university, they don't sit you down and say, okay, we'll hire you as a lecturer. No, you go. Right? So, so of course, there's a lot of pressure on the pre-tenure faculty. And, and so this becomes a very important reason and, and a big motivation to publish. Uh, but in my view, that shouldn't be the only reason. Uh, but that turns out to be uh, a very crucial reason. And it also then decides our policy, department policy. So if, now my department has uh, about 58 tenured, tenured track faculty or tenured faculty. So if you have a large number of people who are pre-tenured and you know that they have to meet these requirements, and then you divert more resources to your junior faculty. So for example, our uh, tenured professors teach three, two. They teach three courses in one semester and two courses in one semester. But our pre-tenured faculty teach a two, two. So we reduce their teaching load by one. Uh, we divert more than 75% of travel funding to our junior faculty so that they can go and do workshops and become more professionalized. And similarly, all our summer research grants, they go to our pre-tenure faculty. So these are some of the things, because of this requirement, then departments become sensitive to it. And if you have a good department, then they would invest more uh, in your junior scholars. And it makes sense too, because you know it, it takes a lot of money to hire an assistant professor and uh, a lot of resources and work. And so retaining them is in the best interest of the institution. So, and there are some other reasons. So you are in Pakistan. Can you share some other reasons for scholarly pub publishing? Uh, uh, should we ask your students back there? 
Good, good, absolutely, and that's very important, uh, very important point, because as a scholar, if you want to have a voice, a public voice, or uh, you know, an academic voice, publishing gives you that credibility. So when someone introduces you, when someone reads your work, responds to it, uh, then you have a place in the debate where you're acknowledged and you're recognized and uh, your reputation travels before you. So that's also a very important reason. Uh, now, if it's just for that, of course, then it would be very cynical, but it does give you a certain credibility. And I've noticed that in my, in my public writing, uh, when I write some blogs or things critical of certain things, so people do read my blogs and they respond to it. And sometimes, you know, people get emotional so I tell them, I was like, no, this isn't the only thing I've written. So if you want to know where I am now, oh, go read what I wrote before this, because this builds up on that. So then you realize that your own repertoire becomes your, your ally in these public debates. Because when someone says, oh, you're too critical of Pakistan, and I was like, fine, but I also love Pakistan. Go and read my 2009 article. So it kind of becomes your own self-reference. So that's a very good reason also to publish. So when you do self-assessment aspect, yeah. assess yourself and play what your work is, can you be standing next to the times? Or Absolutely. And also, like when you send an article out, it's kind of a harrowing experience. I don't recommend that you should take it as an opinion on yourself if the reviewers don't like it, but it takes a lot of courage to do that. And then when you succeed, suddenly you, you realize that you've augmented your confidence and uh, you believe in your work more. So it, it, there's a slight risk, but if you're successful, absolutely. Uh, it, it does that for you on a personal level too. And uh, for some time in Pakistan, institutional rating has been linked to uh, publishing in the journals. Uh, I would not say books for journal publication. So, HEC categorizes institution on the basis of effect factor journals. Yeah. So, it's another emerging Yes, uh, it's important. I, I disagree with HEC's policy. And I have a meeting with them next week about humanities, and I'll mention it to them. Uh, but yeah, I mean, your institution's rankings uh, depend on how much your faculty publishes. I mean, that's also in the United States. Your rankings, your departmental rankings, depend on the placement of your graduate students, where are they getting jobs, and also on publications of your faculty. So that applies even in the United States. But the difference with HEC is HEC doesn't distinguish between teaching universities and research universities. So for example, NUML is a teaching university. The, the professors and faculty have very high teaching loads. And it does a great job of teaching their students. So there has to be a different criteria to gauge the success and ranking of teaching universities because, I mean, comparing Kaidi Azam University with Nomul is like comparing apples and oranges. I mean, Nomul doesn't have the resources of Kaidi Azam University. It doesn't have the faculty, the libraries. So that's what we'll be talking about. But absolutely, if you want to enhance the level of uh, prestige of your own institution, publishing is also a good way of doing that. Can you hear me correctly at the back? OK. Apart from the first few reasons, most of the reasons uh, shared here are pragmatic reasons. Absolutely. But I think we have missed one important aspect that is creative impulse. Absolutely. If you have that, you don't have any other option but to write. Absolutely. Uh, Satisfy yourself. Yeah. And, and, uh, and that's, it goes without saying that you are in the humanities or even in social sciences. Uh, Partially because you love doing what you do. A and publishing or writing academic work or even creative work, uh, no one should have to twist your arm. Because, I mean, 
I mean, every time when I, I remember when I was writing my dissertation, we lived in Florida. We had a tiny little house. And I would sit and type, and then I would just laugh to myself and sing, and my wife would know that I'm having fun. So she, you know, she would make me tea and everything else, but she's like, I have never seen so much, much having so much fun writing a dissertation. So absolutely, you have to love it. Uh, but also, uh, as you mentioned, the creative impulse, and I started with you know, Matthew Arnold. I mean, even he says that, OK, there are two kinds of you know, thinking and creativity. There is your creative uh, impulse, and then there is your critical impulse. So most of the times, I mean, I write poetry, a lot of us write poetry, but then we also need to develop our critical impulse, because that's absolutely necessary to write research-oriented academic topics. And another thing which goes with that is also, uh, will, uh, you represent uh, the educated class, uh, I'm hesitant to you, of this country. Um, this is your country as well as mine, right? Uh, we owe it to the place which we call our nation or country uh, to, to add our voice to whatever is happening in this country. So if you as intellectuals um, write, and write in support of a more tolerant Pakistan, a more progressive Pakistan, a more democratic Pakistan, then we will have a, a huge collective voice coming from the intelligentsia, from the academics. And I had to learn this uh, about seven years ago, I think post-September 11, I was at a conference and uh, an Americanist, you know, the, they, he asked me, he's like, why aren't the Islamic scholars uh, writing against Al-Qaeda or people like that? And I told him, I said, they are writing, you know, I said, the day September 11 happened, the Imam of Kaaba issued a condemnation, Ayatollah Khamenei issued a condemnation, the Dean of Al-Azhar issued a condemnation, but they are doing it in Urdu and in Persian, and you guys are not reading it, your media are not reporting it. And so I came back home and I realized, OK, I'm not really a very good Muslim, uh, but I have an Islamic heritage. I come from a Muslim country, so why can't I do that as a scholar? So that's when there was this turn in my writing when I started responding to uh, any kind of cultural stereotyping that comes about Pakistan and Islam in America but also any kind of stereotyping that we mobilize over here. But I decided that day that I was going to challenge um, within Pakistan any discourse that basically says we are it and everything else, else must be obliterated. So I realized that was my role as a scholar, uh, to stand up for something more than myself. And, and that's absolutely another thing that we must do as scholars. Absolutely. And even more than that, uh, writing about it, then you're creating a sp space for a different kind of discourse. Because if you don't say anything, if you don't put yourself on record, if you don't write anything, you've already conceded the public sphere to those who have more guns and more power. So that, I think that's one very important reason uh, to publish and, and, and to write. So this pretty much covers the first part of, you know, why do we publish? We will go to the next, next slide. OK, so now slightly to more uh, uh, detailed um, things, more pragmatic things of, OK, so when you've decided to write, you're a scholar, you have a field of study, you have all the reasons that we have rehearsed right now. Uh, so, so how, 
you know, how, how do we choose a topic for our writing? Let's say if it's a dissertation or a journal article, uh, what's the role of various databases that are, should be or are available in your library? And uh, so for my first question to graduate students, like how do you choose your topic? Okay, so you're write, writing about literature, but you're connecting it to your own lived experience, absolutely. And also because uh, denying that lived experience is kind of, I mean, it's wasting so much of what's part of you. Uh, so if you're lucky, you'll be at a university where no one tells you, look, you can't write about Pakistani novels because they are not English literature, right? But a lot of, even HEC tells you, you can't write about Faz Ahmed Faz, right? Uh, but, so, so something, if, you, if it's a dissertation, it has to be something you love, right? You have to write 300 pages. You cannot write 300 pages about a thing that you hate. So when you go to your advisors and get your topic approved, right? Make sure that you negotiate. Uh, you insist that you will write on a certain topic in which you have a certain expertise, but also a topic that excites you. Uh, because otherwise you will get trapped in a project which you're not committed to. It's, it's just like a bad marriage, right? So don't do that. But similarly, those of you who supervise also ought to know that it's best to accommodate Unless like a graduate student comes to you and is writing and you know that they're writing it because it's easy, no. But mostly if it's a good topic, um, you know, encourage them to follow something that they can use their own experience in and that they're excited about. But even before that, how do you know that what you're doing has not already been done? So that's where your research comes in. So part of your research is know in which area, in which field are you publishing, and then look up. You know, if it's, it's, if it's a journal article, the best is to go to your databases. Now, MLA bibliography uh, should be available to you through Higher Education Commission. Uh, they have acquired it and I think made it available. But if you sit on your library computer and go to the MLA bibliography and put your topic in, thoughts in, it would list for you all the articles that have been published in the last 30 years on that topic. So then you, the second step then is to go and read the abstracts. That's why all journals ask you to send them an abstract. An abstract is part of the metadata. So that would give you an idea of what is pertinent to your topic. And then you go and print or download six, seven, or eight articles that are very, very pertinent to your topic. You read them. And that gives you the idea that, OK, what you have thought of writing about has not been covered the way you are planning to cover it. But it also gives you an idea of where would you enter your, the conversation, right? Uh, because you have to acknowledge the people who published on the topic before you, and then enter the conversation and say, this is what I have to say about it. You cannot do that without research. Uh, for example, sometimes my undergraduates come to me, and especially in my, so one of them come, I mean, this is like a hypothetical student who comes to me and says, I, I want to write on Jane Eyre. And I said, fine, what would you write? And then they would go like, that Jane Eyre is a feminist novel. So I was like, well, that's not a thesis, it's a statement of fact, right? And don't you think that in the last 200 years, someone would have figured it out that it's a feminist novel? But, but so you have to tweak it and guide them to say, you know, uh, don't say something obvious about the text. Just find what others have said about it, written about it, and how can you not say it differently, but enhance that conversation. That's where your lived experience is crucial. 
because you live in Pakistan, you live in 21st century Pakistan, uh, you can pick up a canonical Western text and see how others have written about it and then write about it through your own lived experience. How, it, how is it being taught? How is it being received? You know? And to be very honest, if you send a traditional paper to an American journal doing analysis of Keats's, you know, poems or, you know, Ode on Aggression Urn or something like Thomas Hardy, your chances of getting published are, are really few. But if you write something on contemporary Pakistani fiction or Indian fiction, and insert into it the specificities of the scholarly debates in Pakistani culture, there is a huge demand for that uh, in Australia, in Canada, in the United States, in Britain. Now, I'm not saying that demand should drive our writing priorities, but you know, part of publishing internationally is that it's an HEC requirement, but another reason is that that is where your voice needs to be heard, right, as scholars, so that you can complicate the way Pakistan and these regions are being represented or, or thought of. So, so reading in depth and breadth, as I said, you read the abstracts to know what kind of articles have been written about your project, and then you read the few that are very crucial to your argument in depth. So on the whole, uh, pretty much, let's say for a 20-page article in a journal, uh, you will have to know the knowledge of your field, right? You will have to have read all the books uh, that are contemporary in your field. But then the journal articles, you will be reading, reading about 20, 30, sometimes 60 articles. Now remember, to publish one good quality article in a refereed journal takes about a year. Okay? from beginning till the end. Uh, so the first stage is doing your research, reading, taking notes, OK? Uh, so and there are different ways of taking notes, OK? Uh, now, even in our own household, my wife writes differently. I mean, she's a Renaissance scholar, so I write differently. So her ways, she will have a notebook, whatever she reads. She has an order list of her notes, very neat. And when she starts writing, she goes to those notes. In my case, of course, I write on my books. I write on my articles. And so when I go to writing my article, I have nothing in front of me except for the primary text. Everything is lined up in my head. And so I just write my first draft blind just giving myself cues, cite someone over here, do this. So these are two different v ways of taking notes. Uh, find what works for you. But do remember that whatever you read, will, it will come really handy if you know where to locate that sentence, if you have given yourself some ideas of what you can do with that one sentence or two sentences. So take good notes. It applies to your dissertations and long book projects as well as to your articles. Right. So I already covered. Uh, and then you should, you will need knowledge beyond your field, especially if you're doing humanities. So a little bit of sociology, a little bit of anthropology, history, psychology, philosophy. Uh, even when you teach humanities, you know that. Sometimes you're explaining something from a sociological perspective. Sometimes you're using economic theory. Sometimes you're using political theory. So to further hone and add to the depth and sophistication of your articles, you know, just read a lot. Just spend the rest of your life reading. So <laughs> that, that should work. OK, so coming to, uh, I mean, and these are, as I said, the, this is an experiential, exp this is how I do it. You don't need to do that. So then is the writing of your first draft. So you don't get to your writing unless you have done your research, you have done your reading, and then you sit down in front of your computer, or if you write in manuscript, you sit down with your Right. 
also Mostly it's in the first sentence you introduce the primary text that you're writing about. So if it's Ag Kadaria, River of Fire, you will start briefly with published in 1955. River of Fire was a huge novel in the Urdu world when it came out. So it kind of cues in the, the reader and the reviewer. And then you give a little bit of, okay, Kuratul and Haider herself translated it in 1999. It's called River of Fire. She calls it a transcreation. Just a brief introduction. And the next should be your thesis. Now, I have reviewed for PMLA, I, I've reviewed for a lot of top tier journals. And uh, the form that we get, the review form, asks us, in most cases, is there a definable, sophisticated, concrete thesis? So much that sometimes I love inductive reasoning and want to write open-ended articles, it's always better to have a very concrete thesis, probably in the second paragraph but most importantly on the first page of your type because the reviewer will be looking for, I mean, they will read your introduction and then the next question is, what is this person trying to say? Or what's the thesis, okay? What's this about? And then immediately after the thesis, you will account for how are you going to accomplish that, right? How are you going to answer the question that you posed yourself in your thesis? But I'm going to skip ahead and show you uh, 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 what kind of things govern concerning a thesis. Next one. OK, so th this is roughly uh, totally uh, taken from uh, Purdue's website. Um, they have a wonderful website on writing. And uh, so, of course. Uh, before you write your thesis, you have to determine what kind of a paper are you writing. So is it an analytical paper? Is it an expository paper? Or is it an argumentative paper? So if it's an, an analytical paper, your thesis would be different. If it's an expository paper, your thesis, of course, would be different. And same for the third one. So basically, an analytical paper breaks down an issue. So you are basically starting with, here is a concept, or here is a government policy, here is an education policy. And in this paper, I will break it down to you as to what it means and what it is asking you to do. So your thesis then would be different. An expository paper explains something, right? So most complex is an argumentative paper, which most of us write. An argumentative thesis is out to prove a point against some other points. So your thesis could be, you know, Iliad is not really about, uh, you know, Achilles. It's actually about, uh, you know, the will of gods. And here is how I will prove it. The text becomes your instrument. The text becomes your proof. But throughout, you are trying to prove a certain point. Uh, on the next slide, I'll show you. Like, So he, these are the possible thesis statements. So can someone read it in the back? Zaheer, since I know your name, I can call on you. The first one, example of an analytical thesis statement. An analysis of the college admission process reveals an, uh, one challenge facing uh, counselors accepting students with high test score or students with strong extracurricular backgrounds. OK. So basically, it's a very simple thesis. You have two constituencies, two kinds of groups. And here is how many they have accepted because of this and how many they have accepted because of this. You're not arguing for one group or for the other. It's, you have your statistics, and you explain them. Uh, the, an expository thesis, 
The life of the typical college student is characterized by time spent studying, attending class, and socializing with peers. And so then when you go on to write about it, you will highlight and explain all these three things that you mentioned. Exposition is explanation. You will just explain it. You can do it theoretically or you can do it through empirical research. Here is a survey that we sent to 40 students. They said they spent this much time on this, this much time on this, this much time on this. And then the argumentative thesis is high school graduates should be required to take a year off to pursue community service projects before entering college in order to increase their maturity and global awareness. So now you have set yourself a proposition. You have set an idea, and you are going to argue for that. Why? So you will make moral reasonings. You will make ethical reasonings. Within that, you will give um, you know, uh, statistics. But throughout the essay, this is what you are arguing from. So what a thesis does is, when you know what kind of a thesis it is, uh, it forces you to focus your writing. And we also call it a controlling idea. Because when you're writing, not in the first draft, but eventually when you're revising, part of your revision is to read each paragraph and ask yourself, does it relate to my controlling idea? Does it relate to my thesis? And if it doesn't, chances are you either need to revise the paragraph or just totally excise it, right? uh, delete it. So can we go back to the two previous? So, so going back to the, uh, the first draft. Now, if you're writing a non-research-based, but not by non-empirical research-based, but a typical paper about uh, a piece of literature, then, of course, you would need to rely on theory. Right? So you can't just do analysis of the text especially if you're targeting American journals or Canadian journals. Most humanities journal in, um, journals in America and Canada and even in, in, United, in UK expect you to use literary theory. And that can be very hard, but it can also be very fun. Uh, now, most people, even my graduate students, sometimes they make the mistake of finding their theory and then matching it to the text. So if they want to do class analysis, let's say they would say, OK, this is what Marx says about class. So in uh, you know, life in the iron mills, here is the bourgeois class, here is the worker class, and here is the petty bourgeois, and all that. Well, that's not what you do in a paper. You don't just pick up your theory and then match it with the text. I mean, theory is a tool. So you give your thesis, your introduction, your thesis. Then you provide us, you know, which tool are you going to use? So you would say, you know, Derrida explains the concept of difference like this. Spivak builds on it. I am going, and tell your reader, I am going to tweak this concept with this, this, this emphasis, and then read this text with that lens. So clearly define your theory, you know, whichever theorist you're using and how you're using it. Uh, and that's very crucial, because uh, you, just, you don't just want to put a quote there and two block quotes and then assume that somehow they will connect. And then for the rest of the essay, you will be applying that to the text, because theory is the tool that's opening the text for you. So you. Given your introduction, you put your thesis, now you're explaining how are you going to do it, so you give your theory, and then you give an account of whosoever has written about this. That's your literature review, but it's an embedded in the body of your paper. It's not given as a separate literature review. So that's where you go and cite so-and-so have said this about this novel, so-and-so have said this. Be respectful, you know. Uh, you can literally destroy your, uh, the arguments before you 
But there is no reason to gloat. I mean, just be nice so that even when you encounter them two years down the road, you can still be friends. I remember, people make a lot of enemies through their publications. And they make those enemies because they, uh, they forget that it's not about calling someone out and telling them you are better than them. They, they forget that it's a conversation, right? Uh, and uh, I've had great uh, response from people. The first paper that I wrote that was revising another scholar's work and drastically challenging it uh, was in my seminar in, um, on modernism with Hunt Hawkins, who was a great Conrad scholar. And I wrote that as a seminar paper, and my sentence there was, um, you know, had Hunt used this theory, his argument in his 1982 article would have been more persuasive. And I gave it to him as a seminar paper, and he really loved it. He wrote back and said, Masood, if I wrote it now, I'll write it differently. So I, what I'm saying is, when you are responding to someone else's work, they already feel acknowledged and respected. Because after all, you've gone out and said, this is what Raja says, right? Uh, but if you misread them and just build your own little castle on that misreading, they are going to come back and there'll be a, a, a vicious scholarly attack, but also you will run into them down the road. So you don't want to make enemies unnecessarily. Just be gracious uh, and, and, and defer with them politely. But do keep in mind that you do make enemies with your writing. Uh, and then is your primary text, right? Then you go into how you will use that tool to reread it. You've already given us your theory. You've already given us what, how others have read it. And now we know that you're entering that conversation and you've already told us, I am going to read this with this lens. Rest of the paper is your argument, you doing that, and wherever possible or wherever needed, citing someone else, building your argument block by block. Right? So that's the basic structure of a paper. And so I also teach my students that connect it to the world, try to do that. If you can't, that's OK, too. But then we come to how to write your first draft. So figure out what works for you. You know, what, so space is important, right? What kind of a space do you need? Is it comfortable? Uh, do you need a cup of tea? Whatever makes you happy and makes you want to write. Some people write, I mean, there are two main ways of writing the first draft. I always use Jenny as one example and me as another. Jenny is my wife. So, so she agonizes over every paragraph, right? Until that's perfect, she doesn't move on to the next paragraph. The result, it, it takes her longer to write the first draft, but when she's done, she has a finished paper, right? I sit down in front of a computer when I'm ready, and I write my first draft in one sitting, if it's a paper. If it's a book, I write my one chapter in one sitting. So by the time I've, I'm done, I have 16, 20 pages of terrible writing, you know, with all the red lines on your computer and no grammar check and everything. But I have my argument there, I have my thoughts there, whatever I want to say, and then I spend two days, two weeks just fixing it, making it better, adding more sources. So that's my way. The difference is that the, the writing research tells you is that whatever helps you tap into your unconscious and reproduce it without breaking it for some reason is better because you're capturing, you're, you're writing, you know, Sandra Pearl, uh, not Sandra Pearl, uh, Pearl has a term for it, your gut feeling. So whatever your feeling is about the topic, you're trying to capture that. Uh, so, so, but figure it out, what works for you. So, if there are no questions, I'm going to take a short break here, because you're all fasting, and uh, I don't want to put you to sleep. And we'll take a five, ten minutes break, and then come back, okay? okay. Thank you. You're sitting in a corner, it must be hot. <laughs> 